this is a quick introduction to the uh, videos that are going to follow. I'm going to first uh, introduce a video in 2016, which is this one here, Max Egan on Zen Gardener and Ken O'Keefe, offering some clarity. And that's from September 7, 2016. And the whole video that this was garnered from because it is the only version that I have been able to find anywhere so I had to take a uh, 59 minute video that this guy did uh, and his channels Kip's Clip I'll leave a link to that full video it's an hour long and I ended up with 17 minutes and 17 seconds of actual max. It took a lot of editing. There were hundreds of cuts to take out this guy's comments. And you will notice when you listen to it, they weren't all successful. But if I cut out the comments too much, there would be no continuity to Max's conversation. So there's a little bit of, you know, this um, young fella piping in. Just try and zone him out and ignore him. That's 17 minutes long. Then it goes to, to 2020, to this year. This video is April 6th. It's from an original video called Sovereignty in Australia, a conversation with Gunnam Bhadi Jakamara and in brackets Mark McMurtry. The original video was 56 minutes long. This edit is one point, well, one minute 51 seconds long. This clip was taken nine days later, April 29. It's called Sacred People, Sacred Land, a conversation with Gunnam Batty Jakamara. The original video was 20 minutes long. This edit is 10 minutes, 41 seconds long. And this video was done last month in August, August 20. It's called Max Egan in Conversation with Gunnam Buddy Jakamara. The original video was 21 minutes 51 seconds long. This edit is 39 seconds long. And all of these ones from 2020 can be found on Max's BitChute. The um, original one of the 2016 one, as I said, there is no version I've been able to find anywhere, and I've tried extensively. So it's um, 30 minutes all up, just a, an introduction of a then to bringing it into the now, to give an overview of... I'm going to fill in a lot of details and blanks between those four years and a little bit before that that actually led up to 2016. So I'll leave it at that and uh, let the videos run now. Well folks, what a mess. What a mess things are today. Matching on. There's people putting out videos, you know, Max on Zen Gardener, as if they actually know what my opinion on the Zen Gardener issue is. Of course, they've got this opinion from one post that I made on Facebook when I said, well, looking at the Zen Gardener issue, there are two possibilities. Who knows which one it is? I think we need to have some sort of rational, uh, calm investigation before we go out and have a lynching. In fact, you know, I think we need to try before any lynching in any case of anyone accused of anything. We need to have questions asked and we need to have, you know, rational answers to these questions. And that's what I suggested, basically that, you know, 
you need to have a trial before you're lynched. And if you're accused of anything, I'm sure you would like to have a trial before you're lynched. And I think the Zen Gardener does the same. And having said that, Zen does have a lot of questions to answer, and I'd like to see him answer these questions. I'd like to see him being given a chance to answer these questions. You know, Zen has questions to answer such as, you know, what was your position in right, and then he goes into the children of God? In the children. I think that is uh, you know, something that people should question, folks, because there are no gurus in any of this. This whole thing is about people's own path through life and about finding out what the truth is. So having said that, the position that I've taken with Ken O'Keefe, I want to really try to explain this to people, why I did the things that I did and why I did it in the way that I did. When the World Citizen Initiative first started, Ken put forth this idea he had that he wanted to see if we could create some sort of lawful contract that would provide a legal means or a lawful means to prevent us from being able to fund war. So we'll be able to withhold hold our taxes from government and say, okay, well, you can't make us pay taxes because we're contractually obligated to not fund any organisation that's funding war and you're funding war and, and waging war, so we're contractually obligated not to pay you any tax. You know, theoretically, this could work because there's no real contract that exists between you and government that's valid because... <laughs> and it's going to be different in other countries, so you've got to set it up so it's going to work all around the world. Can this be done? Obviously, this is going to cost a lot of money to see if this can be done. It's the and you're funding war and, and waging war, so we're contractually obligated not to pay you any tax. You know, theoretically, this could work because there's no real contract that exists between you and government that's valid because there's never been any full disclosure. So by setting something like this up, you could conceivably get some person, one person, to challenge the system and actually succeed and set a legal precedent. It could actually work, but of course it's complicated because you've got to do this state by state. It's going to be different in the United States and it's going to be different in other countries. So you've got to set it up so it's going to work all around the world. Can this be done? Obviously this is going to cost a lot of money to see if this can be done. So yeah, Ken said, well, let's see if we can do it. So we set up the fundraiser. Well, he set up the fundraiser and I we supported it because I thought that's what it was about. A lot of people supported it because that's what it was about. So the concept was to set up this website, run the fundraiser, see if this could be done, get the legal work happening to see if it could be done. So this was the get out of done, and then we get to Acapulco, and I we get ask Ken, well, what's going on? And he says, well, I've spent $4,000, and it doesn't look like there's a way of really doing this. Yeah. But then he says, but it doesn't matter. We can do it. We can get the numbers. We can do it anyway. And I'm going, well, hang on. If, if it can't be done legally... Right, so yeah. four grand of what, a hundred odd thousand pounds? We can do it anyway, we can get the numbers, but we don't need money to do that. We, we don't need to be selling people a certificate for a dollar, which is what you want to do. Why do you need to be selling people a certificate for a dollar if all you need is numbers? Because the money's just going to get in the way, it's going to confuse people, and if there's no legal ramifications or no legal standing to the document, then why do you need the money? Well, what are these people going to be defending? There's no legal defence in the document. You're doing it through, by pure numbers. You don't need any money involved. So what's the fundraiser for? And I didn't really see Ken for the rest of the whole time that he was in Acapulco. And after that, the, the team's coming to me and they're complaining. They're saying, well, you know, he, he wants me to set up this website to launch the project and we don't know what the project is. Nobody knows what the project is because obviously it's not what it was supposed to be because what it was supposed to be was seeing if this could be done. And now I'm being told that it doesn't look like it can legally be done. So, okay, what's the fundraiser for? Why aren't you just giving the rest of the money back and saying, well, it can't be done legally, but if we get the number, we can do it anyway. At that point, if you actually gave the money back, you would have everyone go, and you oh, wow, this guy is totally on the level. He really wants to do this, and you'd get millions of people signing up, you know. But he, he didn't want to do that. Yeah. And I'm meeting another guy there, who, a guy called Ken Cousins, who says he's done the legal work, and he's back-engineered every legal system in every country, so he knows how it works. So I'm saying to Ken, well, why don't you guys get together, because he's got all the goods you need to be able to work, make this work in every country. But Ken didn't even want to talk to him. Nobody wanted to talk to each other, and, it, and we couldn't get hold of him. And this has gone on for months and months, and it's going on, and they're yeah. freaking out, and they're asking me. So I'm sort of thinking, well, what's going on here? So I'm starting to approach Ken, and I'm saying, well, this is really dodgy. Things are looking really bad, and a lot of people have recommended on my say-so. So 
Yeah. It's going, what is the mission? Nobody knows what the mission is. You've gathered all this money. Now we've discovered that the, the original plan of this Unset legal document or this lawful standing to prevent uh, us funding war isn't going to happen. So what is the mission? What are we supporting? All our faces are out there, our names are out there supporting this project, and none of us now know what we are supporting. So I'm trying to get answers from him, and I'm not getting any answers. And then the team is, is basically freaking out, saying they want to go public, and I'm saying, well, hang on a minute, this is, this is my friend. Hang on. I want to give this guy every opportunity to do the right thing. Yep. So I meet him in Philadelphia, and we end up having yep. basically a screaming match with each other. And folks, I've been travelling for 59 hours, I've been awake. I've been travelling for 46 hours. Ken's giving me all this legal stuff, and I'm going, OK, well, you, you've got some idea. Just deliver the goods, and I'll keep the team off your back. Just deliver the goods, and let's see where we're going with all this. Let's see what you've got because we need to have something that's actually going to work, not just some pipe dream, you know. And then um, the next thing I know, I get the subversion report in the mail. And I look at this and I think, OK, well, what is this? Now, I'm being accused. I'm being accused of subverting the mission because I'm asking questions and the mission just isn't what it appears to be. So this makes me question everything that I've ever done with Ken. I started really looking at this and I started really questioning my whole and relationship with this guy. And the team's there and they're saying, well, what do we do now? And I'm saying, well, Ken's saying he's going to release this subversion report. He's told me to prepare my strategy of lies because he's going to release this report. And then he says, and if I hear one whiff, then I'll release it. So I'm going, so people are about to be burnt. And I've got no explanations from you. I've got no explanations from anybody. So all you people out there who are accusing me of this and accusing me of that, whatever, you know, I don't really care. Whatever you accuse me of, whatever gets you off, work your way through it. I don't know. But you see all these red flags that I saw up to this point, and you tell me, what would you have done? What would you have done at this point? You know, when I can see the damage that this could do, what would you have done? I didn't think that I had any other choice. What am I going to do? Go to the police? Why would I? Why? Go to the police. I speak out about these people all the time. What's this going to do? Time legal red tape? It's rubbish. That's happened with every legal round the fundraiser Ken's done. And look at him now. He's still doing it. You know. And for him to turn on me the way he did, I don't know. This guy was my friend. And why did I wait so long? Because he's my friend. Yeah. You know, I'm an empath, folks. I really feel for people, and I really care about people. And what I did coming out with what I said about Ken is one of the hardest things, possibly the hardest I've ever had to do in my life. Certainly the hardest thing that I've had to do since I've been speaking out about people and speaking out about this system and trying to make some change in the world. So you can judge me however you want, but I just called it how I saw it, and I felt that I had a responsibility to do, do so. I've actually received... Dozens and dozens of thank you letters from people. I've received letters from people that have been involved in Ken's past fundraisers. I've received letters from people that are involved in this fundraiser. And a lot of people have thanked me for what I did and said that they wanted to say something, but they couldn't because they are nobody and nobody would listen to them. And in fact, that the only person who probably came out with this information is me. And so I did it. And I don't really care what anybody thinks about me for doing so. But look, folks, all the conspiracy theorists about, you know, who I am and what I am and all this sort of stuff. Listen, so your smallest violin in the world. I'm a nobody, folks. I'm a guitar. Nobody's questioning us about you. My life was a train wreck until I was about 40. You know, until my wife left me, and that's what really woke me up. This, and then... This is what I would be saying if... It took me about another five years to really claw myself back to any form of decency. <laughs> and then I started speaking out and trying to really, really do the right thing with my life. And anybody can do that. It doesn't matter what you've done. It matters what you do, right, and he do from this point forth. That's what really counts. But I'm not anybody, folks. And all these rumours about this, this rumour, someone's put up there the picture of uh, Ken and I and David Icke. Look at them. Thick as thieves, you know. Thick as thieves, folks. You know, I've met David twice, David. But I, I met him when he came to us. No, Denise is. We went out to uh, Ayers Rock because the guy who organised the tour organised for me to come along. And I met him again that day that that photo was met with Ken and I. That was actually the first time Ken ever met David Ike. David was speaking so at the, I don't know what the venue was, it was on Isle of Wight. And I was in England, it was in 2012, it was the first time I'd ever been to England. First time I'd ever actually met Ken O'Keefe and I was staying at his house. And 
Yeah. David was speaking at the Isle of Wight. It was his preparation for his big gig, and I think. So I called him. I sent him an email. I said, David, can you put a call name on the door with a couple of friends? And he did. Yeah. So I went along to the gig and I saw the gig and then I went backstage to meet him and I took ah, to meet him as well. That was the first time Ken ever met him and someone snapped that shot. I think that's the, well, actually the last time, that was the second time that I ever met David Icke and it's the last time that I ever met David Icke. It was the first time Ken ever met him and we were backstage there talking to him for all of four minutes, I think. Yeah, thick as thieves, folks. Thick as thieves. It's amazing what conspiracy theorists will do. Yeah. What they'll come up with. Yeah, don't come up with any conspiracy theories about him. But folks, I did what I did. It's a mirror. Because I felt that I had to do it. And I really had no choice. And I did it the way I did because I really didn't think I had a choice in that either. You know, I just do things, folks. I just follow spirit. Right. And I do things. And if it feels right, I do it. And yeah, it felt right. But it feels bad too. You know, I feel very, very bad for the pain that Ken is suffering. And I don't encourage anyone to take any action against Ken. I don't encourage anyone to abuse him or to hate him or anything. You know, I don't hate him. I don't hold grudges. I feel sorry for him. You know, I reached out to him and I told him that I would do this if he didn't do the right thing. As we open this. I told him that I would, I would snap. I warned him that I was getting close to snapping. Oh. And when I snap, shit just happens, folks. It just does, you know. But um, I don't encourage any bad action against Ken. And, hey, you can think whatever you like of me, whatever gets you through. To be honest, I'm, you know, seriously thinking about packing it all in anyway. I can't really afford to do this anymore. I've spent my entire life savings and trying to wake the world up. I get a lot of complaints from people as well. All of you ask for donations, you know. Folks, I did this for eight years before I even set up that Patreon account for people to be able to offer regular subscriptions. And you still don't have to subscribe to get all the access of the website. You know, I've put a lot into it and I've done what I can to try to wake the world up, but I don't have any resources left. I did have, you know, all my SGs, all my guitars, all my stuff, but I've sold it all. I've got rid of everything. And I've just lived off my savings and off the stuff that I've had for the last eight, ten years while right. I've dedicated everything into trying to wake the world up. And it's been a full-time job. But now, yeah. now I've got nothing left. You know, all I can depend on is if people want me to keep going, if they do like the radio shows, if they want the films and they want me to He's keep going, I need help, I need support. And I'm down to nine stone now. I make an enough money from the website to be able to pay my rent, put Petra in the car, and have about four meals a week. You know, that's not really a lot to ask. That's not really a lot. That's not really profiteering from anything. People ask, how does he get to travel all around the world and stay in all these exotic places? Well, the people who organise the gigs organise for me to fly their folks, and they organise the accommodation. And most of them I don't even get paid for. Most you know, travelling's gruelling, folks. So let's say, hey, look at Max, he's on a world tour. Look at last year or this year. I went to Mexico, I went to Philadelphia, I went to Ohio, I went to London, and I went to Amsterdam, and I spoke in all those places. And that's gruelling. Doing all that travelling is gruelling. And out of all those five places that I spoke in, I got paid once. Once, folks. So it isn't like I do this and for wealth or anything like that. I do it and I go and speak to people because I think the message needs to get out there. You know, I, I really believe in what I say. I really believe that people can make a change if they choose to become empowered. Yeah. And that's what it's always been about. Just respect people around you and stand up together and say, hey, enough is enough. We don't want this anymore. You know, but we're not doing that. We're too busy fighting yeah. amongst each other. And anybody who says, hey, we yes, need we some unity so we can stand up together. Oh, no, he's the new world order. Everybody is attacked. Everybody is defamed. Anybody who tries to create any type of unity at all is classed as a, a shill. Or yeah. Keep people pain to become free. The new world order. And if you don't believe in every single thing that I say, you're a shill. You know, we can't have any debate anymore. There's no debate on any. Yeah. Topics. You have to believe in every single point that everybody makes or you're a shill. It's just a new buzzword. It's unbelievable, folks. I mean, there used to be some sanity in this movement. There used to be some hope in this movement. Yeah. There used to be some direction. But now it's just a big mess of infighting. Yeah. All I've really done with what I've done, folks, is 
open Pandora's box a little bit. You know, it's time to clean out the trash, it really is. It's time to start calling things for what they are. Good. Sure, I don't want a witch hunt against Ken, and I believe questions should be asked, and they should be answered, and we should be given a rational opportunity Just to do that. But I did that with Ken. I gave him every opportunity to answer these questions and to just show us what this mission is. Because if we're supporting a mission and we don't know what it is, and it costs $12 each for everybody to sign up and you want them to sign up more, and I can just see a lot of money being funneled into a situation where, okay, you know, this media hub that you always talked about, that you want to set up on Dominica, you know, if that's what it was about, you should have said that in the beginning. You shouldn't have said it was to create a lawful contract and then, oh, well, now that we can't do that, we'll just get the numbers and we'll set this media hub up to do it. That isn't how it works, Ken. Energy scheme. If you want to set the media hub up, you do the fundraiser to set the media hub up on Dominica. But you don't do what you've done. It's just not honest. There's no integrity there. I don't care what you say. There's no integrity there. And for you to have sent me that subversion report, I'm your friend. I, friend, man. I am your friend looking at the camera we've done stuff together that i haven't done with anybody we've done stuff together hi folks on a lot of the reports i've been bringing you lately i've been talking about the need to treaty with the tribes and the benefits we can get from that and you know what's really going on here with sovereignty in this country now we're in a pretty desperate situation at the moment folks and when I've been presenting this to people, a lot of the comments I've been seeing is, oh, you're saying give the country back to the Aboriginals, this is going to achieve nothing. Well, no, that's not what I'm talking about at all. And for a start, as I've mentioned before on the reports, there is no such thing as an Aboriginal. But in order to talk about this, um, I've brought someone here to, uh, to explain things to you who knows the situation pretty well. And it's a pretty important guy that I've got here. This is a friend of mine called Gunnam Batty Jakamara. That's his tribal name. He has a, a white person's name as well. You may know him as Mark McMurtry. He's made a, a reasonable amount of noise about this sort of stuff in the past. But Mark's a very specific man. He's a very, um, a very unique sort of an individual. There's, a, there's actually a, a story, there's a prophecy that exists in tribal culture that there will one day be a man who is a white-skinned man but has the blood of both tribes and knows the law of both realms and will be able to bring the people together and bring the country back to the people. The tribal elders all believe this is Gunnambati Jakamara. And having come to know the man over the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, I must have known the man by now, um, I've come to believe that this is, is true as well. So I brought him onto this report today to just explain the situation of sovereignty in this country and to, uh, to show you what's really going on here and just to try to explain it in terms you can understand. And, I just want to give the floor to you, Gunnam, and just tell us what's really going on here. What is the situation? Where do we stand? And well, how, how can we get out of the mess we're in? Uh, I'm just here again with Gunnam Batty Jakamara. I thought I'd bring you an update on what's going on with the, the tribal land. There's been a few questions. I'll give you a little bit of a pan around here to have a look what's going on. This is the land we're talking about. For anybody who's familiar with Australia, there's Mount Warning over there. It's a pretty nice sort of a place here that we're sitting in, folks. But... um. There's been a few questions, so we're going to try to clear up some of the stuff. There's, this land has a little bit of a history. There's a little bit of bad press with one of previous owners, and I've had a few emails and a few people questioning what's going on and stuff. So uh, Gunnam wants to sort all that out as well and tell you exactly what's going on here and what they're kind of looking at, the sort of people they want to have involved and what the vision is here. So I'll hand you over to Gunnam a little bit, and uh, wrong way, and uh, he can tell you a little bit about what's, what's going on. So give us a bit of a spiel on what's going on here with all this going on. Well, what's going on is that, that um, uh, nothing has, there's, no, there's nothing, no issues with any previous owner of this, this block that's been bought to, to, to undertake this development. Um, there was a block next door that was bought and the people who were involved in the purchase of that block um, fell out and that ended up um, with one particular person, but a group of people, but one particular person making certain allegations against the people behind this project. And um, ultimately what happened was that the Supreme Court decided that um, nothing that had been said about this development or the people behind this development or um, any aspect of anything to do with Nightcap 
um, was at fault in any way, shape or form in relation to anything to do with any land, um, you know. Um, and, and the court actually was quite derisive um, of the woman who was making the complaints, G. Linda Norman, Gillian Linda Norman, uh, and it quite clearly stated that she had no concept of or an understanding of any of the concepts that she was trying to to uh, bring before the court. She was making allegations that there was fraud, mismanagement of funds, and this and that, and this and that, and da da da. da. Um, there was nothing. Yeah. It was her imagination and the and the um, underhanded um, behaviour of, of her solicitors that was the problem. Hmm. You know. Um, what, what about if, like, if someone wanted to, you know, someone supports a project and they think, yeah, this sounds great. I want to, I want to buy in. I've got, you know, I've got money to be able to buy a. a uh, ha house and land package or whatever, but you don't get enough, so you, you can't complete the whole lot. But they they want to come here straight away. I mean, there's container homes that are available. Eh? I mean, you could oh, you there's, could there's all, there's, there's all sorts of things. I mean, someone if someone wanted to buy, but it uh, depends what someone wants. We're happy to sit down and talk to anyone. Like, um, but if someone wanted to come here right away and they and you still haven't got the roads done and all, but you yeah. need the money to get it done and they, they're willing to invest in that, they could spend like twenty five grand on a container home. You've got a caravan park there. Yeah. They could drop the container there. They could live in that. Uh, yeah, yeah. For the yeah. next few months while yeah. everything's being developed. Temporarily. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. you could conceivably put like fifty fifty people in caravans in because there's a caravan park attached to the property. Yeah. So you can have people in caravans or container homes that are dropped on the property that could later then be moved up to their oh, house block. Well, there's I, all I sorts know. of I possibilities. Don't, I don't know. Of, there's, there's all sorts of possibilities, but um, you know, so far as the caravan park goes, I don't, I don't know what's allowed by council. Not that, not that we want to we want to jump to their tune, but um, we intend to do what we want to do as peacefully as possible. Um, you know, um, we don't want to be blown with council. We're not not scared of council at all but what we want to do is we want to make sure because effectively this is other people's money so we have to make sure that we act responsibly with it we have to make sure that um, our own political ideals don't get in the way of the reality that there are certain things at this point in time that we have to do we have to tick certain boxes we have to say yes no and do all the right things um, comply make everything work it is possible to do this and that's what we'll do um, whether people can dump a house here or put that there, blah blah, blah. it'd be on a case by case, obviously. So we'd have to we'd have to just deal with council on a case by case, you know, mm. um, until such times as um, there are, there are plans um, for um, us to be able to do something in relation to council, um, which will give us a different standing. But we won't go into that at the moment because. We don't want to wet our gunpowder on that particular possibility. So, all right. I'm just, I'm just questioning. Like, you know, if people do want to buy in, but they can't come and actually build a house straight away because the roads aren't sealed or whatever, or they, you know, they can't get uh, internet to it or whatever at the moment. But there's a possibility if they want to get out quickly, they want to get out of the city or whatever. Is there a possibility they can buy into the land and and set up some way of coming here to stay here? Uh, quite, as, quite possibly. There. There are 26 houses, I believe, on the property, um, which are rented out at the moment. And if people wanted to buy, there's an option. There's 26 houses here. Come and have a look at them. You know, um, you know there's an option there. That's one option. So, like I said, there's, there's, it's a case by case basis how people want to do things. Hmm. You know, um, there are so many different options and different ways that we can accommodate people that want to buy in here. All we want to know is that the people have the right mindset. You know, we're not, we're not, we're not looking for. Um, Nutters, we're just looking for people who like to know that where they live is free from 5G radiation, um, is as close to Mother Nature as they can get. Um, part of the pro part part of what living here is going to going to mean is that that um, there'll be a high interaction with the tribal people on their country. These people, the old people, we've been sitting with the old people for some time now in the development of the project, and they're keen as mustard to get in with the the, the people who buy in and teach them about country, teach them. All about country, this planet. Yeah, but all this bad press. I mean, this has all been cleared up. It, it's that's what people have to understand as well. It's all been, I don't know if I can change this camera. It's a weird yeah. thing, but uh, well, we know yeah. the, the, the the Supreme Court has ordered, um, even for example, for Google to remove um, uh, any trace of the blogs and her comments in any search completed by the Google search engine. <clears throat> so. 
and that's just Google. Um, you know, it's it's it wasn't a resounding victory. It was it was it was a sordid farce, um, and it's been really painful and very costly to a, a, a great number of people. Um, you know, there are families there are families who put their their whole life on the line and into Bulla Bulla, um, who got screwed by her and the lunatics that she stood with. You know, um, I I. I just don't believe that she did what she did, you know, for no grounds. I, I don't remember how many times was she, has she been offered her money back? Five times in open court. Five times in open court alone. She's had 14 cases now that she's lost on every occasion, in every aspect of everything that she said. And all we're trying to do, we're standing here going, listen, lady, you got hurt over there next door. You got hurt over there. But there's your money, can you go away? <laughs> and she's saying no. I want to castigate you people because you bought the property next door to the one that I was involved in. Well, that makes a fucking shitload of sense to me. But that's the logic we've been dealing with. Mm. You know yeah. what I mean? That is the logic that we've been dealing with. That is exactly what happened. The property next door, yeah, as part of what we're doing here, we, we would like to purchase that property. We'd be crazy if we didn't. But that doesn't mean that this property has anything to do with that property. Yeah, that was a whole different you know? bunch of people, so... Well, yeah. some of the some of the people involved in that were involved here, um, but it's a completely different thing, utterly different. You know, the Supreme the Supreme Court, for example, was flabbergasted. Justice Fagan was flabbergasted that she couldn't get the concept that this development is not the same as that multiple occupancy. That they're two different properties. They got nothing to do with each other. Hmm. He was flabbergasted. She couldn't even grasp that concept. Yeah. So how do you deal with people like that? Yeah. And in the end of it, it's cost millions and millions and millions of dollars. But we're still here. The project's still going to go ahead. Um, and the best part about COVID is <clears throat> that I believe people might now see why this type of project is such a wonderful thing and a great opportunity. Um, and at $300,000 a block with dual occupancy, we can build two houses. And occupy two houses for three hundred thousand dollars. Find that in Western Sydney. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Two point four seven yeah. acres. Find yeah. that in Western Sydney. See how you go. Yeah. And then compare Western Sydney to this. Yeah, there's no real comparison. So that's the story, folks. That's what's going on down here with the tribal land, if you want to be involved in that. I think it's a pretty honourable project, you know. I've I've looked into it, you know, because I've been getting a few emails from people saying, yeah, "What's what's going on when I'm when I'm googling this project?" Like Mark said, or Gunham said, it's it was a different project. Yeah, and Google um, it now, you'll find all that has been removed by order of the court. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's a completely different project, folks. And this is, I think, it's a pretty good opportunity. But like I said, you know, I think it's a pretty honourable project. So um, there'll be some links that I'll put below this video. There'll be an email address you can. Uh, you can email inquiries to if you want, or email address. We'll do something like that. There'll be stuff there, because the last time I did a report, I didn't really <clears throat> put a lot of information there. I got barraged with emails and stuff from people wanting to know more. And there's going to be links below, and you can email the people involved, not me. And uh, they'll tell you what's going on if you want to be part of this project, or at least come to the property, have a look, check it out, talk to the guys, talk to Gunnar, meet them, you know, see whether it's something you want to be involved in. I think it's pretty, it's a pretty good opportunity. And... Uh, I think Gunnam's got a good heart, and I trust this. I trust this uh, project. I think it will be good. I'm just sitting here with Gunnam, talking about uh, what's going on with the land and the current situation here in Australia. We're just going to talk about how things are developing down there and, and where it's all going, and what we can do with our precarious future at the moment. What do you think about uh, what's going on at the moment, Gunnam? I think that. Um this is a time in the history of mankind where everyone who walks this planet needs to have their wits about them and need to be very careful with people that have any rule, dominion or supposed authority over them. And they need to be very careful about the things that they believe. 